So without further ado, I will introduce our first evening's plenary speaker, um, Dr. Samuel Gregg. He is the director of research at the Acton Institute. Um, he has a very lengthy bibliography, which I will not read all the books he has published. Many people do not know his, uh, his country of origin is Australia, but he's actually from Tasmania. And so we have a real Tasmanian devil here. Um, his, his bibliography is so extensive and so wide-ranging, I think it really reflects the quality of his, of his mind and of his character. And I say that not just because he's my boss. Uh, he really is um, a very disciplined, clear-thinking scholar of our times when it comes to natural law theory, when it comes to economics, when it comes to the commercial society. Um, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that Sam has no equal uh, in the think tank world and probably in the academy. Uh, it's a real pleasure to work for him. Uh, he is not only a very um, excellent scholar and a good researcher, but also very responsive to the needs of his uh, colleagues and his staff. Um, as long as you don't ask him about American sports, you'll get an answer. And nine times, 9.99 .99 times out of 10, it'll be the right answer. I won't mention what the 0.01 times are, but they have something to do with new natural law and Leo Strauss. Um, Sam's talk tonight, which I will allow him to address soon very, very shortly, is on truth, reason, and the quest for equality. Please welcome Dr. Samuel Gregg. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you very much, Kishore, for that kind introduction. I really like the beard, by the way. It's quite something. <clears throat> well, it's a great pleasure, of course, to be here once again at Acton University. And I am, of course, uh, deeply conscious of one thing. And that one thing is that all that lies between almost 1,000 people from more than 50 countries, and the bar is me. <laughs> but before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence tonight of a man who's greatly influenced the thought and work of the Acton Institute right from the very beginning, and many, many people here tonight. And that is the author of, among other books, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, Ambassador Michael Novak. I think it's true to say that if it wasn't for some very courageous ideas he expressed almost 35 years ago, the world would be a very different, less happy place. Now, of course, Ambassador Novak's life attests that ideas matter, for better and for worse. And bad ideas or confused ideas or ideas driven by sentiment can take us seriously away from what really matters, which is the truth truth about reality. Hence the title of my remarks tonight, Truth, Reason, and the Quest for Equality. Now the place I'd like to begin is with a question we at Acton are often asked, and that question is this, why is this event called Acton University? In particular, why do we use the word university? After all, no degrees are offered or given. There's no grading of participants. There's no tests which people have to pass. And there's no tenure track for faculty to agonize about. <laughs> but perhaps the best way of explaining why we use the word university is to recall the origins of the university and its purpose. This is, I think, very well summed up 
in the mottos of two very famous universities. One of these was founded in the New World, more or less at the beginning of the Enlightenment. The second was established more or less at the beginning of the Middle Ages. Now, the first of these institutions, these universities, Harvard University, has as its motto, veritas, truth. Not diversity, not justice, not utility, not equality, and not even liberty. No, the motto is truth. The second institution, Oxford University, has as its motto, Dominus Illuminatio Mea. Now, many of you already know that this comes from the first sentence of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light. Now, light, as many of you know, has particular meaning in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Light conveys the idea that the world is in fact contingent upon God, that things radiate because of their constant dependence upon God's original creative act. Light also implies good over evil, justice over injustice, being over nothingness, freedom over slavery, truth over lies. But perhaps above all, light in the scriptures is an intimation of reason. The divine reason that is God himself and the natural reason that reflects the imprint of God's reason upon man. An idea that's captured in the language of image, of man as the image of God. Now this, I think, is very important when it comes to understanding why universities such as Harvard and Oxford, such as Cambridge and Prague, such as Bologna and Salamanca and the Sorbonne, why they began in the first place. But why did this happen? Why didn't this happen in the ancient world? What motivated people to come together to these places to learn? What did they want? What were they seeking? Well, they weren't founded because people were consciously trying to create something called a university, or because they were trying to create something called civilization, or because they wanted to make a profit, or because they thought that learning would enable them to just banish suffering from the face of the earth. No. These institutions, these universities, were founded for a more basic reason. The people who established these universities, these institutions, were for the most part clergy and monks. And they were seeking God. They were seeking the definitive and the lasting that precedes everything else that's provisional and temporal. And it wasn't a search into total darkness. They believed God himself had provided signposts to the truth in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. In other words, the university enterprise began from a longing for God, from a love of the word, the logos, and from a desire to explore this word in all its dimensions. Through knowing this word, the monks believed, man would come to a greater understanding of the Logos. The same Logos who's imprinted his logic, his reason, on man's logic and man's reason. So the monks were confident that reasoned disciplined exploration of the truth about reality, metaphysical reality, theological reality, philosophical reality, scientific reality, and economic reality. They believed that this would lead them closer to fuller knowledge 
of the Logos himself. Now, this search, the monks knew, couldn't be undertaken as a solitary exercise. It wasn't a coincidence that just as in the Jewish rabbinical schools, ancient texts were studied together in these embryonic universities, just as prayer was done together in synagogues and monasteries. And the monks didn't limit their collaboration to the people of their time. No, they studied, for example, what the Hebrew prophets had said about God, what the church fathers had said about the scriptures, and what people such as Aristotle and Plato and Plutarch and Thucydides and Cicero had written. And it didn't take long for their inquiring minds to try and understand what the same Logos had written into the book of nature. So that's why in the so-called Dark Ages, we see the establishment of not just schools of theology and philosophy and law, but also the foundations of the modern sciences, even of economics. Now, this endeavor, the university enterprise, it wasn't without its risks. There was and there is the risk Indeed, the guarantee of many errors. There was and is the risk that the university enterprise could degenerate into thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking, what I like to call the German disease, rather than thinking about the truth about reality. And there was and there is the risk that man could lose confidence, that he could know anything at all with certainty. Or, conversely, that we can know so much that we can just dispense with the Logos who makes it all possible. So what happens when man, instead of following the signposts indicated by the Creator in Revelation and Reason, decides to design his own signposts? The short answer to that question is that many things happen and none of them are good. Some will opt for a conception of God as nothing more and nothing less than divine will. A God who can behave unreasonably and who can command us to behave unreasonably. Yet others will opt for the modern Prometheanism of techno-utopianism, believing that we can achieve immortality through science. Some will lose confidence that we can know any theological or moral truth through reason. And as a result, many will start believing that the true, the just, and the right can no longer be known through logic and reason. Instead, Some will settle for the true, the just, and the right, being determined by the transient decisions of temporary majorities or the arbitrary will of the party or the arbitrary will of the leader. Now, all these positions and many more have been embraced by many people today. But the worst temptation that I think faces Jews and Christians in a world that has lost confidence in reason's ability to discern the fullness of truth is what I like to call the temptation of sentimental humanitarianism. A temptation that I think helps explain much contemporary commentary on the subject of equality. So what's sentimental humanitarianism? The short answer is that it's the culture in which those of us who live in the West live, move, and have our being. And this isn't a coincidence because sentimental humanitarianism feeds parasite-like 
off the West's Jewish and Christian heritage. To understand this, we need to recall that the God revealed in the Bible of Israel and the Christian scriptures isn't just the Logos who enlightens our minds. He's also the God of love. And that love has never been seen as somehow opposed to reason and truth. The commandments that God gave to Moses and which were forcibly, forcibly reaffirmed by Christ are given to man precisely as an act of love. They aren't rules for the sake of rules. They are given to us to help us live the pathway of the truth that leads to true life. This means that God's love is misunderstood if we think, as some do, that it somehow allows us to ignore those commandments. Love is what also enables us to start again when we fail, as we all do, to follow those commandments. Once, however, we strip this God of love of his nature as Logos, then all we have left is a love that's no longer grounded in truth or even interested in truth. We may even start believing that reason is the antithesis of love and mercy. Because for all sentimental humanitarianism's claims to love human beings, the true sentimental humanitarian doesn't take the human mind very seriously. In fact, sentimental humanitarianism is rather uncomfortable. In fact, it's very, very uncomfortable with any substantive account of reason. So what are the effects of this? There are, I think, three. First, sentimental humanitarianism redu reduces most debates to exchanges of feelings. You know you're talking with a sentimental humanitarian and when someone responds to your argument with expressions like, well, I just feel that, or you can't say that, or today's ultimate trump card, that's hurtful. Sometimes articulated as, that offends me. Well, as the British novelist Ian McEwan recently told a group of American graduate students, quote, there's nothing virtuous about being offended, end quote. Second, sentimental humanitarianism facilitates naivety, naivety about what is, after all, a fallen world. Sentimental humanitarians tend to think that everyone is of goodwill and we can dialogue with anyone about anything. Now, one would have thought that the 20th century would have cured Jews and Christians of such illusions. But sentimental humanitarianism blinds us to the fact that there are people with whom dialogue is impossible. There's nothing, for example, to discuss with ISIS. Nothing. Its creed is submit or die. The only thing ISIS is willing to discuss is the terms of your surrender or your degree of dimitude. A third effect, a third effect of sentimental humanitarianism is its refusal to take reason seriously means we don't take free choice seriously. Instead, we start believing that all evil in the world emanates from poor education or unjust structures or the current fashionable explanation for all the world's ills, inequality. Now, structures, laws, and policies do matter. They do matter. But in the end, the choice to behead someone or kidnap people's daughters or incarcerate enemies of the revolution in a gulag, 
or herd Jews into gas chambers is a free choice to do evil that can't be explained away by the fact that someone else is wealthier than you. So this leads me to the third part of my remarks tonight, a subject which seems to be given such attention today that some might describe it as mildly obsessive. And this is the topic of inequality, especially economic inequality. Now, we all know that when it comes to the Jewish and Christian view of man, there's certainly a place for equality. So what's the fundamental understanding of equality articulated in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures? It's important to remember that it's not about the obliteration of difference, whether it's cultural, economic, or social differences. It's not about sameness. It's not about saying that all choices are equally valid and who am I to judge? For Jews and Christians, equality is essentially about human dignity. Now, dignity happens to be a highly overused word today, and usually for reasons that have nothing to do with human dignity and everything to do with promoting causes that actually undermine human dignity. There's a reason why every euthanasia organization in the world has the word dignity in its title. But theologically speaking, dignity is, is expressed in the notion of the imago Dei, that all humans, without exception, are a reflection of God from conception onwards. But the best philosophical definition I have ever read of human dignity was written by one of the 20th century's great philosophers, Elizabeth Anscombe. Put in simple terms, she said human dignity means two things. First, there are no superhumans, there are no subhumans. There are just humans. And these humans are equal by virtue of the fact that they all share the same human substance. The second idea conveyed by dignity is that all humans are all intrinsically superior to the rest of the created world. Not everyone, however, understands equality today in quite this way. In fact, much of the way that equality is discussed right now simply doesn't meet basic tests of reason. This is especially true when it comes to the subject of economic inequality. Back in November 2013, a line appeared in a document issued in the name of a rather important Christian leader. This line read, quote, inequality is the root of social ills, end quote. Now, I'm focusing on this expression because the context of that remark was a discussion of economics and economic inequality. But let's consider the statement in itself. Quote, inequality is the root of social ills. End quote. Well, on many levels, that statement certainly puzzles me. Why? Well, first, the root of social ills is not inequality. The primary root of social ills, of all our problems, of all evil, our sin, our fallenness, our choices to sin, and the fact that we and this world are not perfect and we will never be perfect. Second, the statement implies inequality is somehow intrinsically unjust. Yet, many forms of inequality are not unjust. I wish, for example, that I was the greatest soccer player in the world. But I'm not. I'm really not. Diego Maradona, no matter how old and crazy he may be, is always going to be a better soccer player than me. 
That's the Argentines. <clears throat> so Diego and I are unequal. We're very, very unequal in our ability to play soccer. This inequality of talent between Diego and myself, however, is not an injustice. It's not a social ill. It's not a personal evil. It's simply a result of the fact that as great minds ranging from Maimonides to Aquinas to James Madison have written, God gave everyone different talents. That means that all of us are naturally unequal in many ways and that we are meant to be unequal in many ways. Third, some forms of inequality are, in fact, just, including some forms of economic inequality. Some people have more possessions than others because, in many cases, they've taken risks and they've worked harder than those who have taken no risks or who have been lazy. Fourth, economic inequality is not the same thing as poverty. I'll say that again. Economic inequality is not the same thing as poverty. They're two completely different things. Think about it. You can have a society in which there are vast economic inequalities, but no one is economically poor. Bill Gates and I are self-evidently not economically equal. But his greater wealth does not mean that I am poor. You can also have societies in which everyone is economically equal because everyone is equally poor. Now, despite rumors to the contrary, I'm not saying these things to be obnoxious. My point is this, that if we're going to talk about economic inequality in ways that accord with reason, I say again, with reason, rather than going along with the emotivism and populism that characterizes the discussion, we must be clear about the facts. We must be clear about what is a problem and what is not a problem, and we must be clear and coherent in the language we use. There are two reasons for that. The first is that truth itself demands logic, coherence, and attention to detail. Second, we need this type of coherence if we actually want to do good, if we actually want to address those forms of economic inequality that do damage the common good instead of just emoting and feeling good about ourselves. But in addition to basic points of logic, any coherent discussion of economic inequality demands attention to what we know about, for example, global economic inequality. So here's some facts, some facts worth considering. First, global economic inequality is in decline. Let me say that again. Global economic inequality has been falling for many, many, many years. Since the 1980s, more nations have integrated themselves into global markets, and that's resulted in a more economically prosperous and equal world than at any previous time in recorded history. Yes, vast economic inequalities continue to exist today, but there's much evidence, much evidence, that shows that global economic inequality is falling. Between 2005, in 2010, five years, for example, the total number of poor people in the world declined from 1.3 billion to less than 900 million. In other words, approximately 400 million people escaped poverty in a five-year period. 
So how has that poverty reduction occurred? Well, it's occurred primarily because 2.6 billion people in East Asia are wealthier than they used to be. Their economies are also growing faster than Western economies. And that means that the income gap between the West and the rest of the world is falling. By allowing people to exercise economic initiative and sell their goods and services freely in the global marketplace, East Asian nations allowed more people to create more wealth and reduce global economic inequality in the process. So why am I stressing this point? I'm stressing this point because I think that many people of faith, many good people of faith, seem very, very reluctant to acknowledge these truths. Why, I often ask, are we so reluctant to acknowledge that economic globalization, for all its problems, has made life materially better, longer, and healthier for millions of people, including millions who were once poor. A second set of facts. We should also ask ourselves, what happens when governments focus all their attention, all their efforts on reducing economic inequality? Because if inequality is the root of social ills, which it isn't, then that's what governments should presumably do. Well, we know what happens. Take, for example, Venezuela. Economic inequality has fallen in Venezuela over the past 10 years. And economic inequality has fallen because the wealthy have fled Venezuela and taken their assets with them. The middle class is in Venezuela is getting poorer as the government resorts more and more to what Venezuela's bishops earlier this year courageously described as policies of totalitarianism and socialism. So what about the poor in Venezuela, you might ask? Well, the poor in Venezuela are also becoming poorer, but at a slower rate than everyone else. So yes, economic inequality has certainly fallen in Venezuela, but everyone is worse off and the country is in chaos. A third factor. A third factor we should consider is that taking economic inequality seriously means taking seriously what we know reduces poverty. Let me put it this way. If you accept that ongoing economic growth is indispensable for taking increasing numbers of people out of poverty and keeping them out of poverty, then you have to accept a certain degree of economic inequality in society. Put another way, if, if you want the economy to grow, you need people who are hard workers, who are skilled, and who are risk takers. And we know, as Adam Smith knew, but also as Aristotle knew, and as Aquinas knew, that the prospect of greater wealth does motivate many people to work harder and to take risks. That means they have to be rewarded for their hard work and for their risk taking. And guess what? Such rewards inevitably lead to economic inequality. Now, people and governments can choose to deny that incentives matter when it comes to wealth creation. Governments can even use their power to radically reduce levels of economic inequality. That's what populist governments have tried to do everywhere. And look at the results. More poverty, extreme political polarization, 
and shocking, shocking levels of violence that some people sitting here tonight have personally experienced. In some cases, it seems that such governments don't care if the poor become poorer just as long as those income and wealth gaps get smaller. Now, does this mean that I think all forms of economic inequality are justified? Absolutely not. One, for example, that I think that's completely unjustified is the inequality that owes nothing to meeting consumer demand, nothing to risk-taking, and everything to being close to the government. Some of you may be interested to know that seven out of the 10 richest counties in America, seven out of the 10 richest counties are in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And what does Washington, D.C. produce in economic terms? The answer is nothing, nothing. Nothing except for rules and regulations and bureaucracy. So, where do we go from here? There's no doubt in my mind that our contemporary debates about economic inequality, whether here in America, whether in one of the more than 50 countries represented here tonight, or even on a global level, these debates are not going away anytime soon. There are times in history when an idea gets a grip on a culture, on people's imaginations, so much so that even the very best of arguments can't dislodge it. There is, however, <clears throat> one thing, and only one thing, that I think serves as a long-term antidote to honest errors, to not-so-honest rationalizations, to wishful thinking, to despair, to utopianism, and to the sheer laziness of skepticism and relativism. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. The name of that antidote is the truth and our free choice to follow the truth wherever it leads us. Because truth clarifies, truth magnifies, truth elucidates, and truth ultimately liberates. Socrates and Aristotle, they were in the business of the truth. The Hebrew prophets were in the business of the truth the church fathers and the monks and the clergy who created the first universities, they were in the business of the truth. And we, we today, we must also be in the business of the truth, whatever our faith, whatever our confession. Because despite the fog of sentimental humanitarianism, despite the haze of sluggish relativism and despite the paralysis of political correctness that shrouds our world, I still think the truth has a chance. And I think the truth still has a chance because the truth is in harmony with what we are as human beings. Yes, the truth may be hard, Yes, the truth means we all have to change aspects of our lives. Yes, the truth means we must face up to logical, empirical, and economic facts about, for instance, inequality. Truths that challenge the lazy existing consensus about this and so many other subjects. And yes, sometimes the truth means we must make sacrifices. Just as millions of Christians today find themselves doing in Africa and in Asia and above all in the Middle East. 
The good news. The good news, however, is that no darkness, no error can totally take away the light of God, the light of the Logos. Because in our very depths, and no matter how much we might pretend to the contrary, there always remains a desire for full knowledge of the truth. No human in history, no one here tonight, has ever attained that fullness of truth. Otherwise, they would have become, as Satan said in the garden, like God. But that's what we're here for, here at Acton University, to discuss with each other, to argue with each other, to dispute with each other what is the truth. The splendor of the truth, the radiance of the truth, that's what we need. More than equality, even more than liberty. Because the truth is the only thing that finally assures us of our dignity. And the truth is the only thing that irrevocably sets us free. Thank you. Thank you.